Take a copy of God's Word tonight, if you would, please. And go with me to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 53, please. Isaiah 53. And actually, we're going to go up into uh, chapter 52, please, and we'll begin in verse number 13. I want to speak to you for a few moments tonight in preparation for the Lord's table on this subject, the suffering servant and the exalted Savior. Verse 13 of chapter 52 says, Behold, my servant shall do deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And as many were astonished at thee, his vintage is so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings sh- shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now in the more familiar portion of Scripture, beginning in verse number 1 of chapter 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of his all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from the prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any seed in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And when thou shalt see his soul, or and thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied, and by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul into death, he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. When we think about this particular text tonight, I, I understand, and I think you would understand too, if we would analyze all the scripture. All scripture, of course, is given by inspiration of God. But when we think about a portion of Scripture that talks about the suffering of the Savior and the great sacrifice for us, and I don't know that there's any greater portion of Scripture that speaks to that in this particular portion of Scripture. And of course, the text is all about the atoning sacrifice of Christ for our sins. And the amazing thing about it is that it, it was given to Isaiah 700 years before it ever transpired. In other words, Isaiah, not ever having seen it physically through inspiration, through the coming of God upon him and helping him to understand and see, uh, painting a picture, so to speak, with words on parchment, gives us this picture of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And of course, I think we're all aware that we are tonight in what is known as the Passion Week, or the week leading up to the celebration of this coming Sunday morning of the resurrection. It's called the Passion Week because Jesus' uh, emotion and passion, uh, so much that he experienced during this this week in, in the leading to the cross and, of course, to the suffering there. There was, uh, as I think about the emotion of Jesus, and I, and I have, to, have to think about a tremendous amount of emotion that was played out in the last 24 hours of his life. 
I, I think we would understand that there was emotion in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus went there and he knelt by, by those uh, olive trees and he began to cry out to his father, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me, yet not my will, thy will be done. And the Bible tells us that he was in such great anguish that he literally sweat as it were great drops of blood. There was passion and emotion when Jesus was arrested and put through what we would call rigged trials that were anything but fair and just and, and, uh, and upright. And certainly the, that would lead to his beating and to his death on the cross. Uh, Pastor Pete just read a few moments ago some of the things that happened on the cross, but there was passion and emotion. Was there not on the cross when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in the final moments of his life, he made that statement, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost, and he dismissed his own spirit. So as we come tonight, we are obviously Bible-believing Christians, and we understand the significance of this great week in history. This week, some 2,000 years ago, as we would call, I guess if you wanted to use a a modern vernacular, was really a game changer for the entire world because this was the the week, this was the time, this was the event for which Jesus was born. It was predetermined before the foundation of the world that Jesus would become the Lamb of God who would die for the sins of humanity. And it is, of course, when Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, would willingly submit himself to the bands of death and you know, walked into the very bowels of hell to redeem our sin-sick soul. And, and, and he suffered, think about this, like no man ever suffered, and he died. He died. He died not for his own iniquities, but for ours and for our sins. He died for me, for every person who would put their faith and trust in him and respond in repentance and faith. So as we think about the, this week ending, this, the week of passion ending, of course, on Saturday, he's in, in a tomb. It ends with his followers cowering and fearing, greatly defeated and wallowing in sorrow. However, Sunday is coming. And early mo- uh, in the morning, the first day of the week, uh, a Sunday morning, God shook the earth, rolled back the stone, sent two angels to announce to those who would come to, to this borrowed tomb that Jesus is not here and he is risen as he said. Now it's during this week of passion that Jesus perhaps, as was already mentioned, either on perhaps a Tuesday night or Wednesday night, would have sat down, and which would be the tradition of all Jews, a, a biblical tradition going back to the days of the Exodus, when God instituted on that night before they were delivered from Egypt what was known as the Passover Supper. And Jesus in the upper room would have gathered there with his disciples to celebrate, or to, not to celebrate, but to remember this particular Seder or Passover Supper. And it was during this meal or at the end of it that he instituted this new observance that we know tonight as the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table. And he command or has commanded to all churches who are Bible-believing churches going forward that we are to do this in remembrance of him. And that word remembrance, of course, speaks of a memorial. And so as we come here tonight, memorials are designed to help us remember not to lose the significance of something. And our church purposely, as a church, really only observes the Lord's table somewhere between four and six times a year. And when we do it, we want it to be very significant. We want it to be something that is, uh, is, is fitting of the moment. Rather than just tacking it on at the end of a service and rushing through it, we want to really savor the moment, really develop the thought of really what it's all about. And that's really our purpose tonight. So this table should have no greater significance than when we deserve, observe it during this week of, of what we call Passion Week or the week in which Christ instituted with his disciples the members of his church in the upper room. I want to just speak to you tonight about this table for just a moment, and then I'm going to deal with this passage. We'll do this very quickly tonight and lead us right into the observance of the table. First of all, I want you to think about the elements of the table tonight. And, and as we think about that, the, when we think about what's here on this table, this is really what I call simple elements. There's nothing elaborate or innate here. There, there's nothing mystical or magical uh, at this table. There are just two elements. The one is contained in the smaller trays. That's what we call unleavened bread, which speaks, of course, of the body that Jesus inhabited. It was sinless and holy. He had no sin. The Bible makes that very clear. He had no sin. And then in the larger uh, serving trays, we have the fruit of the vine. It speaks, of course, of the pure blood of Jesus, untainted with a sin nature, 
no Adamic nature because, uh, because he had no human father. So we think about the, the, the table itself, but, but think about the significance of this table tonight for just a moment. It is designed to help us to remember. So when we think about that bread that obviously we will participate and take in in just a moment, we think about the fact that that bread is not whole, but it's broken. And when we think about that, it represents the broken body of our Lord. It was broken to redeem us from our sin. His body was given. His sinless body was broken to redeem our sinful souls and our sinful bodies from, from the curse of sin. And then I, then I think of the cup, and it, of course, contains what we said, the fruit of the vine or the juice. When we think about fruit of the vine, we think about the, 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 the juice itself. Juice is produced, think about this, by the squeezing of the grape. By the crushing of it. it, it's crushed until it bleeds. And it gives off the juice. And as the grape is crushed, it, it, it obviously gives off that, that, that fruit of the vine. And, and of course, it represents the blood of Jesus flowing out of his crushed body for our redemption. This blood atones or pays for the sin of our soul. And Jesus, of course, gave his blood and allowed it to be offered as a sacrifice for salvation. And I want you to know that that blood is an eternal blood. It, it didn't go away. It, it's, still, it's still very much there tonight to, to cover the sins of humanity. So we have the bread, we have the juice, but then we have the eating or the partaking. The fact that we ingest or consume these elements means that this sacrifice becomes a part of us. Now, now I want to make sure that we're very clear here. We do not believe in, in transubstantiation here. We do not believe that that bread literally becomes the body of Jesus Christ, nor do we believe that the cup becomes the blood of Christ. It symbolizes those things. But the fact that you and I take it in, it, it speaks of, of, by, uh, of our repentance and our faith uh, of, in Christ's sacrifice that has been given for our salvation. And it, it isn't just a simple belief, but it's a belief that has changed every element of our life. Uh, the fact is that when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, not only does he take away our sin, but he makes us a new creature. And it's that, that sacrifice that we receive, that we receive him inside of our, our life. And so by taking this, uh, this uh, bread and this cup, we are, again, remembering what Christ has done. But I also say to you tonight, as we have really been focusing on this table, that it is a vivid reminder and I, and I want us to look at this text for just a moment because it, it, in this text, it helps us to remember some things. Even though it was a foreshadowing or a forecasting, so to speak, of what would happen. Of course, those of us who read the New Testament, we weren't there, but we read what did happen. And, and of course, 700 years uh, before Isaiah tells us what would happen, as if he was standing there, as if he was see, seeing for himself. It, it's, such a, it's a tremendous picture so as we think about the supper is a vivid reminder, well, what should we, we remember tonight as we participate in this table? First of all, I share with you, we should remember his suffering. Look, if you would, at chapter 40, 52 in verse 14 for just a moment. We often just read the 53rd chapter, but really the, the text really begins in chapter 52. But look at verse 14. As many were astonished at thee, his, vin his, visage, his visage would so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. And then as we look at chapter 53, we read verses 3 through 5. He's despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Verse 4, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. <clears throat> but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. In verse number seven, he was oppressed and, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. When we think about the suffering of Christ that obviously is, is spoken of here. When it says his visage, visage was so marred, his, his face, his, his, his facial features, I, I believe um, by the time they were done with the, the beating, uh, probably Jesus, to look at him after all that he suffered, uh, you would look at him and wonder if he was even a man. Jesus was slapped. I mean, not just a, a casual slap, but I mean haul back and just let rip, rip across him. No doubt he was punched. 
We know he's deprived of food and deprived of sleep. He was spit upon. He was mocked and ridiculed. He was beaten with a scourge. His beard was pulled out. A crown of thorns was placed down upon his head. Finally, after all he suffered, they laid that cross member of his cross and he bore that outside the city gates to a place called Golgotha. And I want you to think with me, after all he suffered, he freely laid down. And he laid his arms out on those cross members and they drove those spikes through his two hands and through his feet. The difficulty of the cross, of course, was made even worse, not just because of the physical suffering, but then you add the spiritual dimension of, his, uh, of the fact that our sin was laid upon him. Is it any wonder that Isaiah said his face or his visions was so marred more than any man? By the time we, they're done with him, he hardly looks like a man, a body that's bruised and broken and bleeding. So we, we need to remember the, 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 uh, the suffering. But there's a second thing I think this table helps us to remember, and that is that we remember his sacrifice is for our sin. We, we find in verse 15 of chapter 52, the Bible makes the statement there, so he shall sprinkle many nations. The idea, of course, in the Old Testament was that when the Day of Atonement and uh, the high priest would take the blood of the sacrifice and go into the, the mercy seat, and he would take hyssop and he would dip it into the, the bowl that contained the blood of the sacrifice and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And, of course, that sprinkling would be the, 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 the symbol, symbolic aspect of the atoning sacrifice that obviously brought God and man together. And it becomes the picture of Christ's suffering. But the Bible here says that he shall sprinkle many nations. And then I come here to verses 4 through 7 of chapter 53 and verse number 10. And I want to point out, if you would, would you notice please the pronoun that is found in, beginning in verse number 4. Notice verse number 4, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In verse number 5 it says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Notice there are other statements here that make this personal for us. Verse 5 says, with his stripes we are healed. Verse number 6, of course, speaks that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and yet the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. And of course, verse number 10 speaks of the fact that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And why did he bruise, bruise him? Why did he put him to grief? He shall make his soul an offering for sin. And of course, that sin is our sin, and Jesus did that for us. And we understand that Jesus had no sin nature. He had done no sin. First Peter 2, verse 22 says, He did no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth. Yet the Bible clearly tells us that Jesus was willing to, to die for your sins and for my sins. This, this table has no redeeming quality. We're not being saved by coming to this table. We've already been saved. It's a reminder that his suffering, his sacrifice was for us. And then I want you to remind, be reminded tonight that he was exalted. If you look at verse 13 of chapter 52, notice what it says there. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Verse number 10 of chapter 53 speaks of his exaltation as well. Because Jesus was willing to do all these things, because he was willing to suffer his passion and to bleed and to die, uh, the Bible is clear that because he was a servant, that now he is the exalted Savior. I read to you from the book of Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, familiar verses but the Bible says, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which was above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, 
of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We should remember the sacrifice of Christ, but I want you to know something tonight. He's not dead. He's alive. He's an exalted Savior tonight. He sets at the Father's right hand where he ever lives to make intercession for us. So it's important for us to remember these things. We are right now in this week that some 2,000 years ago would have played out in Jerusalem either today or tomorrow in that Passion Week. I don't necessarily believe in a Friday crucifixion. It, it's difficult for me to really wrap my mind around how you have three days in the tomb if you do it on a Friday, but I, I'm not here to argue that. But here's what I do want you to know is he did that. <laughs> he did suffer. Everything that we talked about just a moment ago, he, he did. And he didn't have to. He did because he chose to do so. And without that, you and I could not be redeemed. There is no other way of salvation. God doesn't have plan B. He has only one plan. And Jesus carried that out. And for those of us who are saved, of course, that's a a glory hallelujah moment. We come to realization that Christ suffered, bled, and died for my salvation. And through simple repentance and faith, salvation is not complicated. People want to make it hard today. It's not hard. It's an easy thing to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But it wasn't easy for him. He did the hard part. He allows us to have the the easy part of putting our faith and our trust and our confidence, resting in him for our eternal salvation. Yes, we have to repent of our sin. Yes, we have to have a change of mind about, uh, about who we are and what we've done. We need to see him very clearly. But the truth of the matter is tonight, as we come to this table, it really is designed for us as a people to just to to relish the fact of what Christ has done, to remember his suffering, to remember that his sacrifice is for us, and to know that he's exalted tonight, and that one day you and I will spend all eternity with him because of what he's willing to do for us.